Hi, Randy Labonte here. Just providing you a quick overview uh, of online learning theories and how they relate uh, to our own work in online learning environments or virtual learning environments, if you like. So in education, we use theories for a reason. The theories do a few things for us. They kind of tell us about where things may be going, where we're at, and help us to draw light and shine on them but mostly they keep us honest to ourselves. So by the time a theory is created, it's really based on a lot of research uh, and it becomes one of those obvious uh, statements, uh, pretty easy to embrace and understand, turning the obvious into the transparent. So, but it's important for us to look at theory anytime we do something that's different in education. And when we start to move our practices online, it is a little bit different. And when we go online, there's a lot of mantras that first rush in. Um, we had .com and then e-learning was going to be the big boom that was going to happen uh, for companies and in the world. MOOCs were going to take over the world and change the whole face of education and post-secondary. But no matter which, uh, we started in K-12 to with that sort of mantra that it's freely and open anytime, any place. You can do it however you want. But that presumes a certain pedagogy. Layer into that the complexities that come with the fact that technology is so pervasive and so involved for us in our world that this now creates new issues for us as teachers and educators in terms of how do we deal with this pace, place, and space issue plus layer in technology. It's a pretty complicated uh, formula for any teacher to take on. So within this Bates and Pool, I think, I've probably stated this the best uh, in terms of with the technology pieces. If technology is the answer, what is our question? Why do we need technology? What is the purpose? What is its gain, net gain? How does that work in with our whole conceptual structure around theories and working with education? The problem is, is that people are quick to adopt technology, but it changes all the time. I mean... <laughs> I think back to my first days of working online and uh, the sound, sweet sound of a 28K modem uh, dialing up to connect to the internet. Um, my teaching style really hasn't changed since those days, but technology certainly has. So it takes us much longer as educators to change. But again, our whole purpose is to serve the interests of students, to help them to grow, become better people, contribute to society, uh, and learn more about themselves and their ability to, to create an effective life for themselves. So maybe we should start there, and that's what Bates and Pools say. So we've got kids. Um, you may have grandchildren like I have grandchildren. So you look at them. What are they doing? How is it that technology lives um, is a part of their lives? How do they interact with it? How do they, do they learn with it? How can they work with technology? So it's a connected world, and it's a connected world that is really starting to be more and more driven by mobile technologies. I watch my grandsons uh, certainly manipulate and work with this all the time. I handed uh, Connor my phone to play a game. He downloaded something. He had the app going. He had this. Anyway, so he knows his way around um, phones and mobile technology very, very easily. So a lot of elementary schools just thought, well, let's let's put an iPad, let's put a tablet in the classroom and see what happens. Well, without any guidance, without any purpose, without any real outcomes that we're trying to do or training for teachers, do we have any learning? Well, that's debatable. So most of the time in school, we're still stuck in this instructional paradigm where the teacher is the font of knowledge and content, distributes it out to students, and then tests them on it. So this paradigm is still very much grounded in the old school days of uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, and then writing a written exam in order to prove that you had, were competent, you understood what it was, that all the content that was there. Well, we live in a world where content is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Information is uh, readily accessible to students uh, and children, certainly in ourselves, at any point in time. So is that really necessarily the right instructional paradigm? So when we start moving online and shifting content online and learning online, there's certain assumptions that kind of come to the forefront. And if you had some time to think about 
does learning occur differently online versus in a traditional classroom? Well, um, the assumption one is that you can transfer the same learning from one situation to another. Hmm, maybe not. But also that whole content paradigm of dispensing or the information transmission mode, as it's called, um, is that you don't really just transmit knowledge to students. You engage them in interactions and, and, and learning where they create some knowledge. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we come up. But the other assumption is that it strengthens bonds between stimuli and correct responses. So that's that paper pencil kind of testing. So we need to check for understanding. Hmm. But also that learners are blank slates. They come to us without any knowledge. Well, I don't think that's quite the case, but that is an assumption the way we build a lot of our instruction and certainly the early days of online learning instruction. And that once you teach them the knowledge, they'll be able to apply that anywhere else. Well, as we know as good teachers, um, it doesn't always happen that way. So really, to me, and this is my own view, effective learning is something that is community-centric, knowledge-centric, learner-centric, and assessment-centric. In other words, that learning is something that is social, happens in a community. It's about building knowledge collaboratively together. That it's about how I, as an individual, interact with that as well as with a group. And there are also ways for me to demonstrate uh, that understanding, that learning, that can be assessed by my teacher. So to me, that's really what effective learning is about. So let's see how that plays out within the whole, the whole mosaic around online learning. So how do I learn? How do I create opportunities for students to learn? That's the question. Well, in education, we've been debating this and going around for eons. Uh, a lot of what I understand about learning was pretty well described by John Dewey in this 1916. So it's interaction is critical and construction is another part of that. So for me to be a learner, I need to interact with content, with people, with ideas. I need to build something different in order for me to understand it. So as we you may have experienced, certainly it was for me, to know and not teach is not yet to know. I learned things really the time when I actually had to help others learn them. So that became an embedded understanding that was a real practical application and I had to construct meaning out of the knowledge, the information pieces that I had. So I really do believe in construction. But I grew up in an era and I started teaching when behaviorism was critical. So it was all about cognitive, it was all about stimuli and response. And it was about almost, I won't say Pavlovian training of dogs, but it was kind of that way. Piaget talked a lot about the hows, the know and tells, the cognitive side. So it's about building content, information, uh, cognitive understanding of different things so that, that I have that uh, in my mind. Well, then Vygotsky started to talk about the whys or the building, the doing, the constructivist kind of approach so that I don't really understand something until I've grappled with it and built it. Um, and lastly, now in certainly in online areas is George Siemens uh, has brought forward, and some would argue it's not really a theory, but I put it on here because I think it's really important. And that's the connectivist thing. The room is smarter than the individuals in it. So it's about the networking, which again, technology allows us to do that. But we are collectively smarter than we are individually. So to Siemens, the connectivist piece is really about building those connections for what? To construct knowledge. Why? Built on cognitive understanding. So I think out of all of this equation, to me, the three C's stand out. Sorry, Skinner, but Behaviorism just doesn't rattle my cage anymore for stimuli and response. Um, it may in some of the corporate training areas that I've been involved with, but mm, not so much here in terms of online and certainly moving classrooms into the online environment. So let's take the three C's and think about this. So how does learning occur? Well, behaviorism is a black box. It's observable, so it's stimuli and response. Where in cognitivism, it's a little bit, you have to structure it. You have to be sort of a little bit purposeful in how that might happen. Constructivism, it's social. You have to create meaning. There has to be engagement. 
And in connectivism, it's distributed across a network. So when you think about that in an online environment, again, those three C's, purposeful, structured, cognitivism, that's teacher sort of um, centered kind of approach, constructivism, that's engaging learners and having them react and interact socially through a distributed network. What factors influence? Well, in behaviorism, reward and punishment. Didn't work too well for me raising my kids. Um, but in cognitivism, it's sort of previous experiences uh, can factor. So it's prior knowledge, prior sort of behaviors and learning and understanding. Constructivism is engagement again, again, and connectivism, diversity of a network. Sorry about that pop up. So what role is there for memory? Well, in cognitivism, we have to encode. Prior knowledge is remixed in constructivism. And then connectivism talks a lot about patterns around how you build in within your network. And then you look at transfer, duplicating knowledge constructs knower, socialization. So you, you kind of see how these, these, these go, that, that basically um, some cognitive uh, base, a constructivist environment in a connected learning space is really how I see online learning uh, being successful. So when we talk about online learning, where did it start? Well, Michael Moore probably was the first to really start uh, this in terms of distance education. So he argued and wrote about the fact that distance education is not just geographical separation. It's really a pedagogical approach and idea that's in there. But the way he wrote about it, he said that it's interactions between and among students, between student and teacher, and student content. So he had those three areas that are really critical. And I'm going to bring those back to you in terms of the community of inquiry model when we look at that. So how do we define online learning? Well, I think Muhammad Ali has done that very well in terms of with the book um, in AU Press. So internet, accessing materials, interactive content, instructors, learners, gee, that sounds like Dewey, uh, or sorry, Moore. Um, obtain support during the process, acquire knowledge, construct meaning, etc., etc. So it, it's a very high-flying kind of definition. Um, but bring into that the fact that a lot of classroom teachers are now starting to use online learning environments as part of their work as well. So then all of a sudden we're talking a little bit about this, blended learning. So this is a term that's come up now uh, and like education jargon is very loaded. But blended learning really is a formal program which has both online and physical space being used but with some element of control. So it is online with all of the factors and things that Ali talks about, as well as Michael Moore talked about, but it brings in some element of control. So go back to the mantra in terms of any pace, any place, any space, any time. Uh, blended learning does bring in those elements of structural control to the individual learner, which means how we build for blended learning may have to be um, considered and, cons and considered seriously in terms of how we construct those opportunities. In essence, to me now, uh, my whole conception about how learning occurs and how I engage learning as a teacher kind of flipped upside down. And I've gone from books to, to computers to really a wide open space. So there's no bottom here. <laughs> you notice the way this diagram works, this picture. To understand it, Ali again also argues, is not necessarily a standalone theory, but more about things that help us design online learning materials. I would argue by going further, spaces and approaches. So to me, it's really about design, purposeful design, that allows us to engage student to student, student to teacher, and student to content interactions. And a theory doesn't necessarily capture that because when we bring technology into the equation, that sometimes confuses and moves us away and off of theory. So a model that works extremely well for me, it's researched. Um, it the, was the basis for the British Columbia uh, standards that were, were published. Uh, and it's uh, very well researched in the literature as well as the community of inquiry model. And it came out, of course, out of Canada. 
as well in Alberta. And so there's a whole website that's set up um, through Athabasca University. Uh, so that model, I think, to me, captures some of the issues around social presence, cognitive, as well as teaching presence, but it captures that those interactions that Michael Moore talked about in the early days in terms of distance education. So I really encourage you to take a look at the, the model and to certainly discuss it as part of uh, anything that you're um, working with. So within the model, we can start to address the questions about cognitive teaching social presence, how they manifest in on-site versus online. Because I think they do it differently. Certainly, I do it differently when I was considered when I was teaching in the classroom. How I engage ideas, how I interacted and directed teaching, and how I created opportunities for students to interact with themselves with each other. And online, again, very different. It's a different environment. I'm recording this and I'm sending and posting this. So I'm not interacting in live time. I'm not saying this in front. I'm not looking at body language. I'm not doing any of that. But I'm trying to give you some conceptions and some ideas. But to really engage your minds, uh, but also to engage interactions between and among ourselves, that's where discussion has to happen. Discussion forums can work, some live chats, Twitter chats. So there's lots of different ways online that I would do that which is different th from how I would do it in the classroom. The timing, the connections, the pace, um, that will vary. Anderson talks about our challenge when we start to move our practice online, and that's to really construct a learning environment. It really is a purposeful construction uh, within that that engages all three of those things, student to student, student to content, student to teacher. And we can only do that by developing a repertoire, repertoire, meaning we need multiple opportunities. This is not something you pull out of a hat. This is something that you continue to move and work towards as an online teacher, that you continue to build your practice, build your resources, build your successes. So the more digital impact and imprint you can create for yourselves that carries with you as part of your practice, that's your LinkedIn, beyond your LinkedIn resume. This is your repertoire of resources that you publish, you post on YouTube, that you have out there, that you create in online environments, that you blog about, that you tweeted about. So it's all those things that create your digital um, persona that are really, really important that allows you to leverage those into different situations with students. So, okay, that's all pie in the sky. That's wonderful. Okay, Randy, so, so what really happens? Well, uh, I had the opportunity to do some research, both in BC and Alberta, but also to examine other programs in other areas in, in Canada. So what I found is that blended and online are blurring. So it's really not just distance education or just classroom. It's kind of in between. It's more, and the purpose is to try to create flexible opportunities for students to meet different needs at different levels in different ways. But in doing so, those that started off totally virtual and online, it's really tough to build back in some face-to-face -face time and face-to-face -face interactions because you've gone in, out there in that wonderful, independent, anytime, any pace, any place kind of environment. And now you're trying to put a structure in, put some timing in, put some expectations in. You know, you got to come and see me kind of, well, that doesn't always necessarily work that well. But as a classroom teacher, can I create some virtual online? Oh, yes. Much easier. But the drivers are personalization and flexibility. And certainly they're mentors that are capturing a lot of uh, ministries of education. Um, in the U.S., it's competency-based. We're not quite there yet in Canada with the same drivers. But I think competency-based is also very important. Sorry about that. Um, not yet, but it's coming. No matter which way we cut it, research is really, really important as part of that, that we have a good, solid research base. And certainly I'm an advocate for that through the Canadian e-learning network that I'm a part of and trying to build a really solid base of research to help us to understand what's happening. But what we've seen, what I've seen, what others have seen so far, while online programs evolved from distance education, which was based on a correspondence model, which was simply just e-text or content, written words, you know, consume it, write an assignment, someone marks it, and you pass or fail. 
Um, that's not really very engaging. But they're now starting, those programs are starting to build a lot more synchronous and also classroom ground-based things. There's a shift from classroom to online, as I said, is easier. So there's several programs that I've certainly been personally involved with in BC and Alberta that do just that, that are shifting back into more blended approaches. Um, in Ontario, there's centralized resources now and tech support. And so classroom teachers are starting to you know, build their practice out into online environments uh, extremely successfully as well. And the same thing in terms of the, our Atlantic provinces. So we're starting to see a lot more of that blend. In essence, what's happening is it's a move towards flexible learning that's occurring. And that flexible learning is where the virtual distance ed programs are starting to come towards um, a more involved campus, some involvement, some physical spaces as well. Instruction and learning is both on-site and online. There's an element of choice and to me it really is taking a theoretical structure around cognitivism, um, certainly uh, as well as a, a constructivist approach in a connected world. So to me, I'll go back to those three C's that are really important.